Hello, everybody, and welcome to another stream. So I'm happy to be back again with The Go Show, and this is episode number three, and we're going to be talking about test-driven development in Go. Now, before we get into this, obviously, I obviously want to welcome you all, but I also want to go through a code of conduct. So as always, please be kind to each other. Please be aware of everybody. Ask some great questions in the chat, and just be friendly. We're all here to learn. We're all here to have a great time. So let me know what you have to say. It's, uh, it's always a good, good environment to play in, and I'm excited to be talking about some more Go with you. As always, I have a Cloud Skills Challenge, which is at the link aka.ms forward slash Liam, or you can scan this QR code here. Now, this is a really good opportunity for you to be playing with some Go, for you to sort of get hands on, see what we do at Microsoft, and just have a little understanding around the kind of things that we are going to be playing with going forward. So as always, I've got my Gopher t-shirt on. And if you follow me on Twitter, also got a new notepad with a little go from. If you see me looking around, so if you see me looking over here, here, I've got multiple screens. So please do just bear with me. I'll try my best to keep, uh, keep on the camera and make this enjoyable for everybody. So who am I? My name is Liam Hampton, and I am a senior regional cloud advocate here at Microsoft. And I work really closely with the Microsoft Reactor team. Of course, we are streaming to the Reactor YouTube. I'm an Austria ambassador, which means that I focus and think a lot about security. So when I'm talking to developers at conferences, when I'm talking to people uh, just generally about coding, security is not always the first thing that pops into mind. I focus heavily on DevOps, which, you know, security is a big part of DevOps. You may have heard of DevSecOps and whatnot. So that's why I'm an Austria ambassador. I'm also a Dev Network Advisory Board member, which means I help facilitate, I help with the organization of hackathons and uh, conferences and helping to understand uh, and sort of build a better community for everybody. I also write a lot of Go code. As you can tell, we are running the Go show today and I like to travel the world. So I've just put a couple of pictures on the slide here to show you some two places, two of my favorite places that I've been to. So what are we doing today? Well, I've already mentioned we're doing testing, but we always have two learning goals. Now, admittedly, for the past two episodes, we've only had one learning goal, but today we've got two. So number one, I want you to understand what test-driven development is in Go. And secondly, I want you to understand and learn how to write unit tests in Go itself. So we're going to go through a couple of slides. I don't like doing too many slides. I'm going to keep it as short as possible, and then we're going to walk through some code. So what is testing? Now. Testing has a significant place in my heart due to previous errors. So I have worked on production systems. I've worked on quick prepared concepts. I've worked on a whole bunch of different sort of projects in the wild. Now, testing is a really important part of that. And there's many reasons for it. But personally, I've been burnt too many times by not writing tests. So I made it a personal goal of mine to write more to help create a safer environment, to create better code, more performant code, and whatnot. So why do we test? It ensures correctness, and so that it runs as we expect. So when you're creating these production systems, you don't want somebody to be putting in edge cases or something that you may not have thought about. Because of course, one problem has many solutions, but you're not always going to get that. So you may write a test which seems perfect. You might write one or two edge cases, but there may be a third edge case that you haven't thought about that the user will encounter, and it'll just be game over. I'm sure you've all seen these memes online where you have the development team creating you know, how to produce something or how to use a certain object. And then you've got the QA team, which come along and use it in a wildly different way. OK, so this helps to eliminate those wildly different obscure edge cases and it helps to run as expected. So that kind of covers the first two points. And the third point is to identify poorly for performant code. Writing code is great, but writing good code is different. Now, performant code is another step forward. OK, so you always want to make sure that your code is running as good as possible. We're in a cloud native environment or in a cloud native world now where we are trying to create the best code possible to be the cheapest code possible. So we're not always taking up so much CPU and memory in your cloud-hosted machines anymore. 
So this helps to create better code. Of course, we've got unit testing, and I'm going to sort of move on to something later, which is called benchmark testing. So it's another built-in part of the GoTool chain, which helps you identify and benchmark your code. So how should we test? OK, there's methodologies. So people recognize that creating tests is wonderful, but there must be a methodology behind it. Because sure, you can write the code and then write the test. But what if you were to flip it on its head and use something called test-driven development? Now, the way to think of this is with the traffic light system. First of all, you write the test code. So you know exactly what you are expecting the function you're going to write to produce. So you're testing an outcome, which is red because it'll fail. You have no code to test against. So your test code will always fail. Then you go to amber. Now I appreciate that's probably not the best color on the screen for you, but you're writing enough code to pass the test. So it can't, it may not be the best code, it may not be the most performant. It could be a really long if else statement. Just it, it passes, it does the job. And then it goes to green. And that's when you look through the code you've written to pass the test, because ultimately the outcome is what you care about at this point. And then you refactor that code. So you may take that mighty long if else statement and put it into a switch or a case statement rather. So there's different ways you can manage it. Test driven development is a really important methodology. Now this is, this goes alongside a whole bunch of other methodologies we're not gonna talk about today. This is just one of them, but it's a cool one. And it's helped save me a lot of time. It's helped me write a lot of code or better code and more readable code. So as a result, you only write the code you needed, it's much more readable, and it should be more performant because you're not sort of floundering and, and creating these great big mess. You're, you're creating a very streamlined approach as to what you want to create. So it should, I put should in italics because it should, doesn't necessarily mean it always will be. So how do we test in Go? So Go is wonderful. It, provide you with a fantastic tool chain of tools. And you have in the standard library, something called testing. So you already have a built-in library to test your code. Brilliant, I absolutely love it. It just helps save a lot of hassle, a lot of imports and a lot of reliability issues that you may find with other packages. And then of course you do have the third party packages. A really popular one is testify assert. You may have come across this if you are familiar with JavaScript or Node um, or maybe Java where you've got, I don't know, JUnit for performance testing and things like that. So you have these third party applications and it's no different in Go, you still have them. But assert is very similar to Mocha and Chai in JavaScript if you've ever used it. You have test files. So in the root of the directory in Go, you have maybe your main.go file, but to test it, you have an accompanying file called the, the main file underscore test.go. And that basically tells the Go compiler or the Go tool chain that you have a test file for the prefix. So the prefix being main and the suffix being test. Okay, so it tells you what, you know, it's a test file at this point. Absolutely brilliant because this helps keep your project organized. It helps to keep you flowing. It helps to keep it tidy. You can tell what's a test file and what's not. So it also helps you with your CI CD pipelines because you're able to go and find your test files in a jiffy. And of course, I've covered unit testing, sort of. But with the test library in Go, you're gonna be creating a lot of unit tests. Now this can get messy, but it's actually really handy. And I'm gonna show you a couple of ways today that we can organize them and where we can sort of play with them and sort of make them better. So of course you have unit testing. And then we have coverage testing, which is another really, really cool part of the GoTool chain built in. It tells you how much coverage of your code you are testing. And I'll show you that again today. I'm gonna to show you all of this minus the next one today. But what this will do, it helps give you a great understanding of what lines of code are being tested and what lines of code are not. And then finally you have benchmarking. Now, 
This is to help you with your performance. So helping you create more performant code or code which will allow you to perform better in a cloud native environment. So often with Go, you're building binaries. Where's that binary gonna go? It's going to be deployed somewhere. You want that to be as cheap as possible in a remote environment if it's not local. So we kind of covered the what is cloud sessions and whatnot in previous videos. But this is where it really comes to matter. You don't want to be spending loads of money on poorly performant code. So you want to make sure from the get go, you are benchmarking for the right system. Because of course, here, yeah, if you look at this screenshot, we have got go test bench equals and the dot. That's basically saying benchmark any function or any test or benchmarking function inside this package. And you can see it's Darwin ARM64. But what if that was Windows on a different architecture? You know, it may perform completely different as it would to a Darwin and an ARM64, i.e. this MacBook. So you can test against different sort of systems at this point, and that helps you provide better, or better code, better products and services for your customers. So benchmarking, another really cool one. Now, that's enough of me speaking because I believe it's almost been 15 minutes already. So let's get into some code and let me show you some different ways we can unit test and sort of run with test-driven development. Then we're going to get back into the slides in a bit. So let me just share the correct screen. And pop this one up here. You should be able to see my screen over here. Okay, wonderful. Now, please do put in the chat, tell me where you're coming from. I see a few, so I'm just, just in stream at the moment. So hello, Ali, nice to see you again from the other side of the world. It's great to have you online. And Axit, okay, t.parallel in testing. We can come back to that at the end because I'm not 100% sure. I haven't actually personally used that. Um, we can come back and have a little look and see what we're doing. So I appreciate this is actually gonna be really small on your screen. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And let's get rid of this folder. We don't want this folder. We don't wanna see that for five seconds. So let's pull this down. So I've got some pretty simple arithmetic that I'm gonna run through. So we've got a calculator and the calculator is going to add, subtract, uh, divide and multiply. So we've got four functions, okay? So let's just clear the terminal. And in here, we want to sort of uh, check out and see what's going on. So I'm gonna write a test file and this test file is going to add. Now we've got our own package and we're just gonna be using the first party testing package and we want to add two numbers together. So I denote the function with the function signature with a capital T. So as we can see in here, I'm on calculator underscore test and it's going to test the code in calculator.go. Now, if I look at the code, I've commented everything out. So imagine this is not even there. Test add, okay? So that denotes as a test function for adding. Now I want to get five, okay? So whatever I put into this test function or this add function, I want to return five. And then I'm gonna say got is equal to the function call. So add in this example, two and three. So two and three added together is five. And it's just gonna say if the got is not the same or not equal to the want, then there's gonna be an error and it's gonna tell me what that error is. So if I go ahead and run this test, it should fail. It shouldn't actually give me anything. Of course it fails, right? It's saying that add is unidentified. Cool, so let's go and create the add function. So let's go and uncomment this add function, which is gonna take in two integers, A and B, and it's gonna return an integer. So we've covered function signatures before in learn go with Liam in the series. So if, you have, if you're not familiar with these, then go check that, that series out. But it's gonna take in two integers and it's gonna return one. Okay, so we're gonna return something. It's gonna return A plus B. Pretty simple, right? So let's go back and test the code. So if I run that test, okay, it passes. Cool, pretty simple unit test. And we can do the same for subtracting. We can do the same for multiplying and dividing. So let's just go and uncheck all of these functions, okay? So I've pre-written these test functions and it's going to, you know, it's going to throw up a lot of errors because we haven't got the functions yet. 
And this is where I'm going to start adding some edge cases in a minute. OK, so let's go and add those functions. So let's uncomment, subtract, multiply, and divide. So this is essentially test-driven development. OK, so I've written the test. They're failing. I know they're going to fail. You've seen the first one fail if it doesn't have an accompanying function to test. Oh, and I cancel that one. And save. Now, when I run these tests, so let's just move this one out of the way. You can see I've got a whole bunch of them. Test divide, test multiply, test subtract, test add. And they're pretty simple, pretty standard, right? We're just adding and subtracting two integers together or dividing and multiplying. So now I can just run the file tests in here. So as we can see, they all passed. So another way to test them is to do, so to make sure I'm in the correct directory. So I'm in calculator. I can do test, uh, sorry, go test uh, minus B. And that is a verbose flag. And that's going to show me anything that comes out. If there's an error, then it'll throw an error. So let's just put in an error. I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, so let's say uh, want six. This error is out. Yep. So we can see it fails. OK. And it can say calculator add two and three is equal five, but it wanted six. OK. So it's not giving me what I want. So it errored. So that's what you'd see in a test failure. So let's go and put that back to five and make sure that all passes again. Wonderful. It all passes. Cool. That's pretty simple, right? So now what happens if I want to start throwing in some edge cases? Well, let's say I want to test the maximum number, the maximum integer that Go can handle. So I actually have a function which I've already written out. I'm just going to pop it in. And over here, let's walk through it, OK? So it's test add edge case. Now, this is an edge case because this is going to be the maximum integer that Go can handle, that we can take in. So I'm going to say I want the maximum integer in 64. And then I want to call the add function with the maximum integer minus 1. Now, I want to do a minus 1 here because I don't want a, uh, an integer overflow. If that was not minus one, we'd get a panic. We'd get a, like a stack trace, a dump. It would, it would just not be happy. And then I want to add one to it. So I'm just going to minus one straight away, and I'll add it again. Now, what I'm proving here is that I can take in the maximum, the biggest number that Go can handle. And if it doesn't, then it's going to throw an error. So then we run the test. And it handles it. Perfect. Now, what happens if we throw in a different edge case? So let's go and take a look at the divide function, OK? So in the calculator, we've got divide. Like I said, I didn't spend much time on this one because it's a pretty simple arithmetic at this point. So we're going to take in an integer a and b, and it's going to return a float 64. Now, float 64 is you know, like a decimal. It's not a whole integer. And we're going to return a, or float a, divided by float b, OK? What happens if we divide by zero? I haven't accounted for that in my test. So if I wanted to do uh, six divided by zero, if you divide anything by zero, it should be zero, right? So let's try and run this test. Uh-oh, we have a failure. But I thought my code was OK, because I was testing the divide function. This is where edge cases can really play be a, be a bit of an issue for you, right? Now, this has a little story time. When I was working on a project which was sorting some geographical coordinates out, and it was sort of like not as the, you know, not a straight line taking into account the curvature of the Earth, I was doing some arithmetic, some pretty complex stuff. I thought it was A OK. I had written my tests, I had written the code, it looked good, it performed well. And then suddenly somebody started dividing or throwing in you know, wild integers, which I hadn't actually thought about. So this is what prompted me to do this edge case. So 6 divided by 0 is 0, but it's going to fail. OK, so I've got this horrible here, you know, this horrible error. It's not liking it. Let's go put it back. OK, so how do I fix that? I need to go and put in some code into my function to get it to pass. So this is now test-driven development. We found an error. Now I need to go and write the code, get it to pass. So what's actually happening here? I'm going to say uh, if uh, b is, OK, so 
uh, Copilot's going to help me out a little bit here, but I'm going to write it freehand is zero. Then I actually want to return the float of zero. Okay, so float 64, uh, and I want to put in a zero in there. So hopefully that will change that error that I just caught with the failing test prompted me to now go and change my code, which I can do. So I've written in this little sort of catch, caught it. There is another way you can handle this. You could just catch the error and throw it out in a different way. You know, you might have an error package, but for now, I just want to return zero. So if I do six divided by zero now, and I try and run that test again, hopefully, and it doesn't want to, that's because I haven't changed something. I wanted zero out of this. It works. We've got it. It works now. So working with arithmetic is difficult, but it can be easily fixed and easily noticeable with tests. So that is a simple arithmetic calculator, kind of simple example of unit testing. But what if I want to run lots of different tests at the same time? What if I wanted to do many divides or many multiplies or many subtracts, you know, I'd have to write the same thing. You know, I have to copy and paste that function. Do I want, I don't know, five and, you know, subtracting five from 10, I want five. I'd have to just iterate over. That's no fun. That's not good. So we actually have something cool in Go and we can write table tests. Now I say Go, this is actually a thing, you know, across different languages, but we have table tests and they're my favorite. I wrote a whole blog on this, but that's another day. And now let's close the calculator and look at string reverse. Okay, so imagine we have written the tests and written some code. Okay, so here's the code. Now there's two ways of doing this. I've got this option or I have option number two. One of them is using some funky lovely loop that we wrote and another one is actually using a um, like a range, so a range loop. Okay, and a rune is a um, I think it's a, a Unicode character in Go. Okay, so we're using a slice of runes and we're appending each one as we go around the uh, around the list or around the, the range loop and it's just flipping the characters. We're using this so that we can actually change the characters in place, in memory. It's just a good way of doing it, good practice. Basically the same thing happening just with a little bit more, a little bit more love being shown to the for loop. It doesn't look very nice. It looks a little bit messy. So I went for this option, it's a little bit tidier. So let's look at the tests, okay? On the face value, this looks pretty good. Nothing's erroring, nothing's showing me issues. Um, we're all good, we're all golden. Now, what, am I, what have I done here? I have created a test a structure with a name, input, and expected, okay? So what it is, what I'm passing it, and what the expected outcome is that I want it to be, okay? So just giving it a name, whether it's like a short string, long string, you name it, that's just arbitrary. You can call this whatever. The input and the expected are the two main defining parts of this test. And we're gonna ignore this little bracket here because this proves a really good point when it comes to testing and how people can overlook this and how it often does get overlooked. Now, here is a range loop, and this is another way of utilizing multiple tests. So we've got uh, t.run, which is essentially an embedded test inside test reverse. I could have multiple of these t.runs and it shows you know, different layers of it. And I'm gonna do exactly the same as before. I got and a want, okay? So the expected and the got, basically. So I'm going to say, call the function reverse and I'm gonna give it an input. And if the input or, or the expected is not what we expected to get out, it's gonna throw an error. Now, if I run this, do you think it's going to run? Do you think it's going to fail? What do you think? Throw in the chat. Tell, tell me what you think is going to happen before I click run this test. Now I'm going to hope somebody puts it in. Go on, anybody, throw it in the chat. And if you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'm afraid I can't see those. I can only see YouTube ones. So if you're not, go, in, go onto the YouTube channel on the Microsoft Reactor and just throw in the chat what you think is going to happen if I run this test as it is. Now, this is why it's a dangerous part of testing. Because 
it can create a false positive. If I click run test, it runs, but we haven't actually tested anything. This is a really dangerous part of testing because as a developer, I think, cool, I've written some tests. You know, what if I didn't know how to write tests properly and I was using, I don't know, uh, maybe Copilot or a different tool, maybe ChatGPT to automate these tests, right? It, it gives you a good framework. It gives you an awesome framework, but it's still expecting you as a developer to somewhat know what to put in and what's gonna come back out and what you're expecting your code to do. I've put nothing into this test, but somehow it has still passed this function. It's still sort of, it's giving me a false positive at this point. So I need to go and add in some data. Okay, so let's go and actually add some data. Now again, I have got um, some data which I'm gonna throw in. So just to save me from writing it because more time efficient but I'll explain all of it. I'll explain each line. So we are going to test for an empty string and the input is an empty string and I'm expecting an empty string. Single character. So again, this first element of this, uh, of this object or, or you know, this struct is the name, the input and expected. So single character, what I'm putting in, what I'm expected to get out. Uh, Paladrome, so race car, and race car is the one that can be written and read the same way, regardless of which way you're reading it. An even length string and an odd length string at the bottom. So again, we've got foobar and hello. Now, this is proper data that we're putting in. So now we should see it pass again, but with a little bit more oomph behind it. So now it's sort of down to us as a developer to notice or understand what we're putting in and what we're getting out. So again, if I read, uh, run that one, awesome, it works. So let's actually go into this. Let's start using the command line. Let's see how we can see what's going on. So where am I? I'm in calculator. Let's go into uh, string reverse. Let's do go test uh, minus V and see what happens. Cool. So we can see here a little bit more output. We can see that we have run each of these tests here and each of them are passing. Now, I'm sure some of that is to do with cache. I've actually run this before. Um, it's come up at zero seconds. It's a pretty simple calculation, uh, to be honest with you. But we can see that. So let's actually look at some else. Let's do some coverage. Let's see how we write coverage. I think it's cover. I think it is. We can see that we're testing or covering 100% of our code. Now, I think if I look in here, um, you understand that. And the same thing with calculated test, we're, we're covering each individual function, but that may not be the case all the time. You may not be able to test every single line of your code. So let's look at a server because people often say, you know what, Liam, it's cool that we can test arithmetic. It's cool that we can test strings. They're pretty simplistic libraries, pretty basic ones for you to get hands on with but I write web servers, I write APIs. How do I know what's coming back to me with an API? How can I test that? Well, fear not people, because you can do exactly that with a handler function. If you joined my stream last week, you would have seen me create, I say last week, two weeks ago, you would have seen me create a couple of web servers using a couple of different methods. I think we used a gin, we used fiber, and we used the standard HTTP library, which is what I've got here. So this is what we can see. Okay, now it's starting up a server on port 8080 with a root of slash, just a basic root slash, and it's gonna return us hello world. Now, forgive me, I know this is not the most verbose uh, server in the world, but it proves what I need it to prove. It proves to me that it returns hello world. That's all I need it to do, because now I can see the test and I can write a test for that. This one's a little bit bigger and a little bit more verbose because there's multiple things in this that you can test. There's multiple parts. So again, we've got the package. We're just using package main. We've got a couple of imports, testing, HTTP test, which is part of the HTTP library, allowing us to write handler test functions without spinning up a server. And we've got the net HTTP package as standard. So what do we do? Let's write a function called test handler. Now, I apologize, I haven't live code much of this today, purely because 
of time and I wanted to get through it all within a reasonable amount of time. These are supposed to be lunch and learns, not entire two, three hour streams. So what have we got? We got a request and an error, which is just going to create a new request as a get request for the root slash, like a home root. And it's going to return no, it's going to return no, which is, I guess, the error at that point. So let's actually have a look. Yeah, so it's going to return nil, which is this part over here. And if there is an error, then kaplunk, don't do anything, error out, stop. Then we're going to create a recorder. Now, a recorder initializes a response for us. So that helps us record something as it comes back within this test. OK, so remember, we are not running a HTTP server in the wild. This is just a unit test. It's not a mock test. It's a unit test, which test an isolated part of the code. Now, a mock test will um, mock up some return data. So say I was doing a post or a get request and you're seeing you know, like a proper um, a different server or service and testing the response back. You would mock it. You would mock the response. This is just a body of what we have coming back from this. It's just the isolated part of this code. So. Same again, we have got a got status and a want status because I said we've got multiple parts of this that we can we can check. So we've got the status code. So is it a 200? Is it a 202? Is it a 404? Is it a 500? We're checking against that, okay? So we're seeing the got status and the want status. Okay, we're wanting a status okay, which is 200. If it's not a 200, well, then we've got an issue. And then finally, the part that I really want to test here is the body. And there's the want body and the got body, exactly the same thing. I want hello world. What's it going to provide me? Okay, is this server here going to provide me with hello world? And if it is, perfect, pass the test. If it's not, kaplunk, we've got a problem. So let's run the test, shall we? Let's see what this test returns us. Now it should pass with flying colors. Of course it does. What happens if we change it? Let's just say I want hello world with no exclamation mark. Then we have a problem because it should fail. And of course it fails because it's telling us that I got hello world with an exclamation mark, with an exclamation mark, but I wanted it without one. Okay, so this is a really simple way, again, basic unit tests of what we've got going on here. But now what happens if we introduce coverage, test coverage? Before we've tested every element, every line of code we could, okay? But if we have a look, let's just make sure I'm in the right one, no, I'm in the wrong one again. But let's have a look at test coverage. So go test uh, minus, uh, minus minus cover. We're only testing 33.3% of that code. Why? Well, it's because we can't test every line of it. You know, we're not necessarily checking this part. We're not checking the function. We're only checking the return value from this handler. Okay. So you're not always going to get 100%. But that's not a bad thing because we can tell whether this is working or not. Okay. You should be able to test everything, of course. I'm not saying don't, but I'm saying we wouldn't be able to test the part we are testing without actually a server being stood up in some regards. So you've noticed I haven't stood this server up. It's not running on my machine. I mean, I can do that. And all I do is go run main.go or server.go. It would spit it up. All I have to do is curl the request. OK, so that's what it's doing. But this test function doesn't need that to be stood up at all. And that's because it is using this recorder. It's using this request and the handler function here. So that's the part which is spinning up a server. So in 35 minutes, I believe I've managed to go through most of what I wanted to. Now, how do you run this in a CI CD pipeline? This is going to be the final part because I try and keep these between 30 and 45 minutes for the coding. How do I run this in a production environment? How do you run this in CI CD pipelines? How do you take these unit tests and actually make them useful? Because it's great if you can code it locally and run it locally. And you know, developer A runs the test suite fine on his machine. Developer B runs it on his machine or her, their machine. And it fails. So one passes, one fails. How and why? Well, you're going to have different systems. You may have a different setup. You may have a different environment. Somebody may have a different package installed. Maybe you've got blocking ports. Maybe something is happening 
that's timing the tests out on one machine and not on another. So how do you run it? Okay. So I'm just going to show you an example uh, in GitHub Actions, one of my favorite places to be. And let's see, I should have the code up here. I have got a server. So let's just close this here. I've got a server, which is, you know, rendering some index files for me. This is basically an example of a blog, which I'll show you, which we can put into the chat in a moment. By the way, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and I'll see what I can do when we get back to them at the end. We, you know, we're not far off. How do I test? How do I write some tests? So for this, I've got a main underscore test file. And in here, I'm just simply checking that these files here, main.go, go.sum, and go.mod are present during the running of the tests. Now it needs to be present for it to actually run. I need the the mod and the sum file for the packages that I'm, you know, the versioning of the packages that I've got, making sure that they are available. Now I could run this, it will pass. I know that because I can see them, but how do you make sure that happens in deployment? So I have a deployment.yaml file, which is a GitHub Actions file, which, you know, some of you may or may not be familiar with, um, but we certainly can show you uh, how, how to get hands on with that in a moment. And in here, we've got a Ubuntu machine and we're using, uh, we're setting up Go. Admittedly, this is a little bit older. This is 1.17, we're now on version 1.20. And I know, hands up, I still haven't got it locally on my machine, I'm running 1.19. But this part of the job here, this step, tests, it runs exactly like it would in your local machine. Just you're running it in a cloud environment, in a container. You would do test, go test minus V, and that is dot slash dot, dot, dot. And by the way, that is another abbreviation of just saying, hey, go and find every test file that I have and every test that begins with a capital T and run it under this entire roof. Okay, that's what that command there does. If you were to run that in the root of your directory, it will run all the tests for you. So that is what it's doing in a pipeline. Now I can show you that happening in a pipeline if I go to uh, one of my repositories. So uh, build, test, and deploy to Azure. So it's a blog that I've written, and admittedly it's failing. This deliberate because you know you're supposed to fork this and set up the secrets. But I can show you the action pipeline working. So let's go to the actions, and let's go check out one of these builds. So three weeks ago, the latest build that I've, I ran on this. And let's just jump into it. You can see we've got the different steps in the in the build. And I've got this step here that says test. Now, shout if you can't see this on your screen. In fact, I'll just zoom in a little bit so you can. So open up test, and you can see that it has run the testing file. It's just a bash. It's just bash. It's just running in a terminal as if you would locally. And it's saying, hey, Liam, I ran these tests using that command and the test files exist. So it ran the test file function or test files exist function and it passed. It told me that they're there. Now, admittedly it failed on Docker login because I didn't have secrets in this repository, but the testing part is what matters here. I'm saying, so that is how you run it in Azure or in GitHub Actions to deploy and get ready to deploy to your cloud service provider. In this instance, I'm using Azure. So that's how you would work with them for deployments. And that's how you start to get ready and eliminate the issues of running these test suites locally. Because believe me, tests are wonderful, but you can sometimes write too many unit tests, which cause big issues. So story time again, I was uh, reading, or so I was writing tests in when I was sort of as a developer. And I wrote loads and loads and loads of tests. And it was JavaScript and there was a lot of async awaits. There was a lot of, um, I say blocking, not quite blocking, but there were some, some functions taking quite a lot of time and it just wasn't performing locally. But if you threw it up into the delivery pipeline, hey presto, it worked. So this is always a really good way to automatically test your test suite because you may have many, you may have many functions and many test files and many different unit tests. Because of course, unit test is not the end of it, right? So there's, you've got service tests, you've got integration tests, you've got whole other suites of tests. 
This is just unit tests that I've touched on today. And this is kind of how you would start thinking about test-driven development. You would go and, like I said, the amber, red, amber, green. Sorry, the traffic lights, red, amber, green. So with that one, that is the end of the hands-on coding. Hopefully you found some of that useful. I'm just going to switch screens again. I'm going to um, put my slides back up. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, please do throw them in the chat and I will get to them uh, in a moment. So let me just put this one back up. Cool. So if you haven't already, please go check out the Cloud Skills Challenge. Uh, there's some fantastic content in there. And you can do that by going to aka.ms forward slash uh, Liam. So let me just go and throw in some links. So we have got the Cloud Skills Challenge, which is this one. So you can either scan that one um, or pop in the link. And for some reason, my box has gone a little bit weird. So bear with while I just type this out. On there, you're going to find some really cool learn modules. This will really help you get up to speed with Go. If you're really interested in the language, if you're seeing some of the semantics and you're thinking, hey, Liam, you haven't quite explained that. Maybe it will be, maybe it's already in the one of these modules, or you can ping me directly. But it's a really good place to go, first and foremost. Secondly, we have got some events coming up. On the 21st of March at 12 p.m. GMT. If you're a student watching this, please do come along to the Amir Student Summit. Now, you can get there and check out all of these different links. Um, I'm just going to post in the student summit one into the chat now. And what this will, or what this is about, this is all about building your career. Got some wonderful talks. This is running regionally. Uh, actually, it's, it's running worldwide. But myself and a student ambassador from the UK are going to be hosting this for Amir. So please do come along, say hello, and um, yeah, come check it out. We've got lots of great content for you uh, happening for then. On the March the 23rd at 2 p.m. until 5 p.m., if you enjoyed some of the Go stuff, which I do on the Go Show or Learn Go with Liam, I'm actually being joined by a member of the community, Adelina, and we are going to be doing a Tech Days, a Microsoft Tech Days event. That is going to be a three-hour stream. <gasps> That's quite a long time. Don't worry, there is a break in between. But what we're going to be doing is deploying a three-tier application, so a front-end, a database, and a server to Azure. And how you can do that too is going to be basically a code along, some fundamentals of Go, some different services that you can use with Azure and Go, and how you can sort of use Azure for your development if you're playing with Go, just like I do. So we're going to show you exactly how to do that live from the Microsoft Studios. We're going to be streaming. I think I'm in TVP, so I'm going to be in Reading, which is fantastic. It's a new scenery, so better background than this one. And it's going to be TV production. So it's going to be a proper stream for you all to enjoy. I uh, will just throw the link in the chat for that. If, you would, if you're interested, please do go ahead and sign up for this one. And then on the 29th of March, of course, we have got another two weeks today, the Go Show episode number four. Now, please do let me know what you want to see on the Go Show because I would, you know, I love the feedback that I get. Help me help you because I can go through lots of these quick wins. I can go through some um, sort of pain points. Maybe you want to see something on databases or I don't know, object storage or SDKs. I can show you some hands-on hands -on, uh, code. So please do throw it in the chat or reach out to me on social media. So my handle is uh, da -da 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 there. So you can catch me at Liam C. Hampton, and that's on Twitter and GitHub. Um, please do reach out or on LinkedIn. So that is, if you want to join in, that is aka.ms forward slash the go show for the go show, aka.ms forward slash tech days for tech days, and aka.ms forward slash student summit for the student summit. And I will just go ahead and post in the go show links into the chat now. So we've got two. We have got this one, which is obviously the series, and I've got all the code that's going to be available to you on GitHub. Um, feel free, go ahead and star it um, or fork it and play with it yourself. Um, and that is the same link, but GH at the end. So we have got the Go Show material, which is aka.ms forward slash the Go Show GH. And with that, I think I can round out the stream because it's been 45 minutes. It's been great fun. Everything's kind of worked. We didn't have a freeze like we did 
uh, in the last episode, which is perfect. So if you want to connect, please do uh, scan this QR code. And if you want to take part in the Cloud Skill Challenge, scan the other QR code on the right-hand side of your screen or the link, aka.ms forward slash Liam. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much for joining. And if you have any questions, reach out and uh, see you in the next one, hopefully. Goodbye now.